imagine you go to the, the grocery store and you go, oh, can't pay for your groceries with the Visa card on a Wednesday night if you have milk in your basket. Like what? Like, oh, everybody knows. Like that's just a really not a great settlement that if you're going to shop on a Wednesday night, you got to use American Express or MasterCard. You're like, but no, I just want to buy my groceries. Like, no, you got to pay attention to day of week, time of day. What's in your cart? What, what, what grocery store are you using? What the box is? And like what the last three digits of your card are? Like nobody wants that, right? But that's the state of users at MEV today. There's all this crazy sophistication that users are expected to have. Hey everyone, Sam and Dan here. And before we dive into today's episode, I wanted to shout out MetaMask Portfolio. Are you always constantly stressed like us managing your portfolio across different chains, wallets, LP positions, perps positions? I'm excited to tell you about MetaMask Portfolio, which lets you manage all of your crypto assets across different networks, wallets, all in one place. Do more with Web3 your way with MetaMask Portfolio. You'll hear a little bit more about it later in the show. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Zero X Research. We have an awesome interview lined up today with Matt Cutler, the CEO of Block Native. But prior to that, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Hexens, uh, one of the most hardcore security teams in Web3, pioneering in ZK and novel cryptography. Hexens is trusted by tier one projects like Polygon, including the work on their new ZK, ZK EVM, Mantle, Risk Zero, Lido, One Inch, New Bank, and more. You will hear about them a little bit later in the show, but uh, today is October 5th. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate it. You bet. Thanks for having me. Great to be here, Sam. Great to be here, Dan. So I think the just to set the stage for the listener, can you kind of go into uh, the MevBoost supply chain and Ethereum in the proof of stake world and kind of the role that Block Native has played in that uh, up to date? Sure. It's it, There's a lot happening here and, and our role within it is changing. So about almost exactly a year ago on September 15th, 2022, Ethereum went through the merge. Um, it was the biggest upgrade to the network in its history. And it switched from being a proof of work consensus mechanism where basically computers solved arbitrary math problems to win the, win the right to to write a block, uh, to proof of stake, where instead of solving math problems, you basically stake Ether. And if you uh, play by the rules and do what the network expects, you get a little return. And if you play games or try to break the rules, you get slashed. This had many positive effects on the network, including massively increasing its economic security. But there were other changes that got made to the network at the same time to counteract other concerns. And, and one of the big net, one of the big upgrades was what's known as PBS or proposer builder separation. So uh, at any given time, there needs to be an entity, uh, a member of the network, which is the tip of the chain, which has the right to build the block to basically say, this is the block that's going to become the new tip of the chain. It's going to include the following transactions in the following order. Under proof of work, there was a competitive math uh, game where you had to throw compute and power into that to sort of try to arbitrarily solve this. It was randomized in this way. Um, under proof of stake, it's more ran It's more like someone gets nominated. So uh, today there are, I don't know, seven, 800,000, maybe 900,000 validators on the network. One of them gets selected to be the tip of the chain and they can um, build and propose a block. Um, what PBS does is it says, well, you can outsource that. You have the option as the proposer, as the tip of the chain, to either build your own block or to outsource it to a set of third-party specialists. And it turns out that in today's Ethereum, somewhere between 93 and 95% of all blocks are outsourced to this third-party network. And the reason for that is, it turns out building valuable blocks is hard, that you need a lot of network, you need a lot of compute, you need a lot of storage, you need a lot of relationships um, with entities that are going to basically pay for specific preference and, and ordering. These are known as searchers generally. And so it turns out that an outsourced block is about, on average, anywhere from three to five times as valuable as, a, as an internally built block. And so as a as a validator who gets nominated, you can either do all this work yourself to get a low value block, or you can just outsource it and get a high value block. And that's what people do. And this is achieved via a sidecar known as MEV Boost or MEV Boost, um, which was developed by the Flashbots team. And so it's it's not technically part of the Ethereum protocol, but for all intents and purposes, it, it is part of the Ethereum protocol because 95% of the blocks depend on it. So this creates, a, MEV Boost creates a supply chain where you have user transactions that are in the public mempool. You use your MetaMask or Ledger or other wallet to submit. You have 
searchers, which are more easily thought of as traders who run bots that basically watch those transactions going by. And if they see the opportunity to extract value by ordering things in a certain way or issuing you know, response transactions, what they'll actually do is they grab those transactions out of the public mempool, bundle them with response transactions, either before or after or on top of or something else. And then they ascribe a, a bid price where they send it to these entities called block builders and say, if you include this bundle of transactions, if you get it on chain in this order, here's what I'll pay you, right? And so now you have this notion of MEV or maximal extractable value that gets expressed in the block building network. The block builders try to build the most valuable blocks. So they have relationships with MEV searchers. They have access to the public mempool. They might have their own transactions. And we can talk a little bit about how these things get smushed together. And then the builders compete with each other to have the most valuable block as selected by the, the proposer or the validator. And, and there's this intermediary group called relays that basically protect builders from validators and protect validators from builders. And, and again, they, the, the relay network manages about 95% of all blocks, but there's no economics there that's kind of problematic. And through this sort of uh, intricate network or supply chain, your transactions go from being candidates for inclusion to getting included. Um, there's a lot of consequences to how this work. There's a lot of interesting um, uh, exploits and attacks that have happened this way. And there's a lot of um, value that gets moved around by this whole supply chain. And, and that's how blocks are built today on Ethereum is uh, via this network. So anyways, long answer to a short question. I'm good at that. But but that's a, a quick Reader's Digest view of, of what's going on out there today. Before we dive much further into that process that you just laid out, that was awesome, by the way. Thank you so much. But can you just explain exactly what it is that Block Native uh, maybe did over the past year and how the business is kind of evolving as you kind of figure out where you fit in the stack? Sure. So uh, we've been building on, on Ethereum for more than five years. We're a core infrastructure provider. And we have we build one of the most uh, uh, popular wallet connection libraries called Web3 Onboard. We do a lot of work in, in the mempool. So uh, we provide APIs for mempool access. We provide notification for mempool changes. And we provide um, mempool explorer functionality so people can get access to it. When the merge happened, or as the merge was, was coming up, and PBS was being introduced, we realized we had a lot of expertise to participate in all of this, that we have global infrastructure, we have low latency networks, we have a lot of relationships with interesting folks. And, and we decided to sort of evolve the business into being a block builder and a relay operator. So at the merge, uh, we joined into this and we were participants in this ecosystem. But last week, we actually announced the suspension of those operations, that we are no longer uh, operating our relay and we're no longer uh, building blocks because it wasn't economically viable for us to do so as a credibly neutral provider. And we can talk about what that means. Um, we are increasingly focused more narrowly on, on helping users and wallets have observability into what's going on. So they have understanding of why things settle the way that they do. And then protection so that you can protect your transactions from adverse settlement. But one of the consequences of how things work today is um, traders sort of have the most valuable transactions. They have the highest bids. And so the best settlement is at the top of the block. And that's exclusively the, the domain of large traders, right? Um, because they're paying for it. But as a consequence of that, regular users basically can't compete for top of block. So the me's and us of the world actually have to settle for mid of block or bottom of block, which means less favorable settlement. And so it creates kind of this two lane system, this sort of have and have nots. And, and we don't really like that about sort of how the network is evolving this way. And so uh, rather than participating and maybe even contributing to that two lane situation, we're trying to take all of our expertise and knowledge and relationships and try to level the playing field a little bit to make it more equitable on behalf of users and the wallets that they do. So that's what we're focusing on today. But we're in the middle of that transition as, as we try to find interesting business opportunities. It makes a ton of sense. And I, I love your ethos driven uh, view of, of what, you know, the, how the ecosystem has evolved and should evolve and, and where you kind of fit in in that in that world. So you mentioned two interesting things there. One was 
uh, you know, how do you be like neutral in this activity at, and participate, you know, especially from like U.S. soil or soil where there may not be some regulatory clarity around how you can I interact in this in a legal manner. And the second one was, was the economic incentive. So can you talk maybe first about the incentive side of things? Like where is the economic incentive at least to, to participate in this? Because you see a lot of vertical integration with uh, builder searchers or builder relays. And can you just talk a bit about how that dynamic shapes? And then we can talk about the second piece later. Oh, sure. So big topic. But but the idea is there is this intrinsic value known as MEV, which is the value that can be extracted from controlling um, uh, inclusion, exclusion, exclusion ordering. And, and I always the example I always give is like an Oracle update. So um, Chainlink has an Oracle update that basically shows the price, the price of ETH is collapsing. As a result of that, there's a whole bunch of collateralized debt positions on Maker and Aave and elsewhere that become available for liquidation, right? And let's in the in the, case, in the arbitrary case, let's say it's hundred thousand dollars of liquidation. There's a hundred thousand dollar profit on the table, but probably only one actor is going to get it, and whoever gets it is the one who gets their transaction immediately behind that Oracle update because before the Oracle update happens, they're not available for liquidation. As soon as the Oracle update happens, it's available, and the only way to guarantee that you capture the $100,000 profit is to basically slide your transaction immediately behind it. So this is known as, as controlling ordering. Now, in the old days under proof of work, what would usually ensue, it was known as a priority gas auction where two, two or more than two bots would go to war and bid up the gas price in order to try to get specific ordering. And then everybody would suffer as a result. So the me's and use of the world would pay these exorbitantly high gas prices by this happenstance that has nothing to do with the NFT we want to buy. It's just two bots over here going to war and, and we suffer as a result. Basically, this all got moved off chain into an off chain auction with the idea being that these traders, again, they're, they're called searchers, but I always find searcher to be sort of a funny term because it feels like it's a person who's searching through stuff and they're not. They're just software systems, right? They're, they're trader-like entities who run software to do this all automatically. And, and what they do is they bid for the attention of the builders, right? To say, well, to make $100,000, I'll bid 10 bucks. Like, that's great. But but Dan says he'll bid 20 bucks and Sam says he'll bid 50 bucks and then Matt bids 100. And as you might imagine, we go around and we bid up the price of that inclusion to pretty quickly reflect like the market of like, well, if there's $100,000 of profit, we're probably going to bid pretty close to that. Right. And then the builder then passes that along. Right. And so the idea is the economics are that there is margin that can be extracted at each step. Right? That the searchers are going to basically bid in such a way that they still are profitable. And then the builders are going to bid in such a way that they're profitable. Right. And that there's all this, you know, uh, there's this very healthy network of independent actors, each of whom gets a slice and each of whom are economically incentivized. Turns out that's not how it works at all. Turns out that in production, what actually happens is the value is at the trader level at one end. And at the validator level at the other end, because the traders are the ones who basically figure out where there's profit. And then eventually they just have to pay most of their profit to the validator. And in between, there's almost nothing. There's, there's no value there, right? And so we were a credibly neutral builder. What does credibly neutral mean in this case? It means we don't operate our own trading bots. We're not a searcher, right? We're taking commodity data which is public mempool data. So everybody else had access to the same stuff. We have a bunch of relationships with these searchers, but so does everybody else. So we have the same bundles as everybody else. And we try to put them together in ways that, that are different than everybody else. But it turns out that this is a pretty efficient process and that most everyone puts things together in about the same way with about the same value. And so there's, there's not a lot of margin to be extracted there. The other thing is searchers are like, there's a lot of money to be had in, in the trading side of things. And why do we roll the dice with the builder who may or may not get our stuff on chain or may or may not see our strategy? So, you know, the economically rational thing to do is, is to become a vertically integrated searcher builder, right? And so, 
you have entities uh, that are well established, this is not a secret, that are very large trading operations. And in particular, there's something called sextex arbitrage, which is arbitraging between prices on centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges, which by the way, centralized exchanges can update their prices very rapidly. Decentralized exchanges can only update their prices every 12 seconds. So unsurprisingly, when there's a price displacement between those two, if you're a well-capitalized and sophisticated actor, you can make profit from this, okay? And by the way, this is net beneficial to the network because they help align prices. But why, if you are doing sex sex arbitrage, would you share your transactions with somebody else? Why would you share your profits with somebody else? You, it's just, you're economically incentivized to operate your own builder, to not socialize your transactions. So you can build blocks that nobody else can build because you have transactions that nobody else has because they're yours. Right, and this sort of pattern plays out. It's, it plays itself out in all sorts of other interesting ways, where you could have uh, builders that create relationships with wallets to get exclusive order flow, and therefore have access to transactions that nobody else does, and therefore can build blocks that nobody else does, therefore can get margin. Right, and so you know what was theorized at the beginning of the merge was that this would be a healthy competitive market full of various layers with everybody sort of independent. And, and it turned out in reality, it didn't really play out that way. And, you know, that's part of the reason why, you know, we competed in this market quite favorably. We are, we were at times north of 10% share, but ultimately there was no money in it. There's no margin. In fact, there's often negative margin. You, you bid a little more in order to win the right for the block. And the anticipation is you're making money on the trading behind, but we're not a trading entity. And then there's also actors like these relays, these really critical operators. There's only a handful of them that basically you know, do this really economically valuable and security valuable thing for the network, but they don't get paid at all. Okay, and 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 they're perceived as public goods, even though they're very clear economic beneficiaries. That when the protocol was set up, they were not any fees or any sort of mechanism for them to monetize. And so it turns out that it's pretty expensive to operate a relay. It's quite critical for the orderly operations of the network, but there's no money to be made there. There's actually negative margin because you take on risk associated with being a, a relay. And we can talk about that and some of the regulatory concerns there. And then if the relay doesn't do its job and there's a missed slot, so the relay doesn't release everything, there's only so much time to do things in, and the validator or staking pool doesn't receive the block body, they demand a refund for a service they don't pay for. Right. And so uh, literally, you know, I, I would talk about and I've talked about this quite extensively. Relays are critical for the operation of the network, but they're 100 percent risk, zero percent reward. And and again, you know, we were hopeful that we could find out some uh, inline economic incentive models to make that sustainable. But we weren't able to get there and didn't feel like we're going to get there anytime soon. And so we made the difficult decision to suspend our relay last week. OK, so that, that was some great context as well there as well as especially as it pertains to like the economic side of things, because you know, that's kind of what a lot of this uh, like core ideas are built off is like the rational actor will, will make this economic decision. I want to give a quick shout out to Hexens. As we explore today's blockchain landscape, let's take a moment to recognize them as a premier cybersecurity provider in Web3. Hexens is trusted by tier one projects like Polygon, including a security review on their new Polygon ZK EVM. Mantle, Risk Zero, Lido, One Inch, New Bank, and more. Get a deep dive into your technology stack with the most comprehensive analysis and cybersecurity consulting. Hexens not only uses widely known methodologies and flows, but discovers and introduces new ones on a day to day basis. With over $55 billion secured, they cover everything from smart contracts to blockchain to Web2 pen tests. Yeah, there's been nearly $7 billion of total value hacked in crypto's nascent history, so it's safe to say your team has a lot on the line. Don't skimp out, take your security seriously, and reach out to Hexens. Don't forget to mention 0x Research for a free Web2 pen test with your partnership, and reach out to Hexens at hexens.io. Find them in the links in the show notes, or reach out to them at Permissionless. They'll be at booth 832. Uh, but without further ado, let's get back to today's episode. That kind of brings me to the idea of like private order flow. And you kind of alluded to this a little bit, but do we have any idea like how prevalent the private order flow is? And like, you know, are the largest builders today, is it almost like, like, is their edge having private order flow? And so they can build more or more, uh, they can extract more value from these blocks that other builders don't have access to because they have this extra order flow. 
Um, so short answer is yes. So we have Block Native have published research that said, you know, it was a little while ago that we published it, but over the course of the past six months, the amount of private orders, meaning uh, uh, transactions which do not appear in the public mempool, but then do appear on chain, grew from about 2% to about 15%. And when I surveyed the audience at, at Mev Day at ETHCC in Paris, generally everyone th thought that that trend would continue. And in a year or so, we'd be at about 50% private transactions, right, as a mechanism of, of protection. And so certainly private transactions are a, um, a growing phenomenon and a fact of life today. The reason why you have a private transaction is you're trying to avoid some of these um, concerns about adverse settlement and, and, and your, your transaction being part of some sort of MEV attack. And actually, we, we've subsequently published some research that says it, it may not be uh, so cut and dried because you generally wait longer for a, a private transaction to get on chain and therefore you increase, you, you may suffer worse settlement due to increased slippage. So there's like trade-offs to do. Sometimes it's better to be in the public mempool, sometimes it's not and, and how to do it. But certainly the notion of proprietary order flow, so uh, which is, is a subset of private transactions. Proprietary order flow is orders that only one builder or some subset of builders may have, right? Either it's because it's self-generated, i.e. they're the trader, they have their own transactions, they don't socialize them to the rest of the network. And again, the idea is then you can build a more valuable block than somebody else can, okay? Um, there's also things like, again, you pay for order flow, which is not unlike what Citadel does with um, Robinhood, right? Where uh, you can have wallets that basically share orders with small, you know, without it, uh, share orders with a limited subset of network participants to give them exclusive rights to um, either trade against that, i.e., you know, extract MEV, and or to build blocks from that. And there's, you know, uh, very real money changing hands today, you know, for those exclusive rights because. Why does that make sense? If I have access to orders that you don't, I can create trades that you can't. And, and oh, by the way, we went through the example of if we all can see the opportunity, then we just bid against each other and it gets a lot more expensive. But if only I can see the opportunity, then I can make a much more profitable trade because I don't have to worry about you guys competing with me. And, and that very much is you know, a fact of life today. This has negative consequences for the decentralization of the network. There's a, a really smart team called Special Mechanisms Group, uh, Max Resnick and his team. And they published research that said, that showed that when asset volatility on Binance went up, there was a specific builder that won 75% of the blocks. And, and you go, well, what's the problem with that? You go, well, what if that builder doesn't like you? You need to get a transaction on change. And they just say, no, nope, right? Or, or more realistically, what if you're a competitor to that builder, that you have similar strategies, but the only way for you to get on chain is to give your order to that builder. And that builder says, no, I have a better, I have my own order. And, and I'm just going to pretend like I didn't see yours because my I make more money that way, right? And so it's economically rational for these actors to, to, to behave in this way. They're not doing anything nefarious. But the consequences for the sort of equity on the network are, are not great, right? And, and this is why we're creating this network or the network is increasingly sort of bent in this direction. And, and it feels not ideal. And, and I've talked about this publicly, like we don't want to have a network where users are suckers. We don't have a network where LPs are suckers, where, where they don't get a fair shake, where they can't compete for, for best settlement. And yet some of the forces at play, that's kind of what's happening here. And, and we're trying to encourage everybody to both be aware of these situations and to you know create infrastructure or protocol changes that perhaps level things out a little bit. And I think that's actually a, a great segue there is... is put the the piece on protocol changes so you mentioned you know we, we obviously have pbs today but it isn't technically enshrined it's just widely adopted i think you know somewhere around the neighborhood of of 95 percent or so uh are, are opting in to use mevboost what the if we were going to enshrine it what would it need to look like uh to maybe satisfy some like fix some of the problems that we've just discussed over the last 20 or so minutes um, well, it, it's so there's this is a very active area of research and very much part of the um, Ethereum roadmap. Um, there are, you know, a bunch of, uh, of work and specification on what's known as ePBS or Enshrine PBS. Um, 
but that's not a panacea. You know, there was originally the idea was that enshrined PBS would eliminate the need for these uh, relays, these trusted uh, uh, intermediaries. It turns out that that doesn't seem to be the case, that there will still need to be uh, relays even in an ePBS world. Um, you know, one of the interesting factors of all of this, which is pretty fascinating to me, is you have this network of builders, you have this network of validators. Builders are, are generally pretty well-resourced entities. They have, you know, big amounts of compute, big amounts of spend on cloud services. They may or may not have uh, a lot of economic resources to fund their trading operations. And they are trying to get the attention of a little teeny tiny validator, right? which could be one of you guys with a Raspberry Pi under your desk, right? Or it could be part of a staking pool. And if, if you just get exposed to each other, right? You know, you get hammered into the ground, you know, because these builders are just going to hammer you with, with bids, right? And, and you could have uh, denial of service attacks that try to prevent you from, from seeing things. And so you kind of need something in the middle to insulate you from all of that inbound network traffic. And you want to get some protection against people lying. Like I can, I'm a builder and I say, hey, Dan, I got to block this with 100 million ETH. You're like, oh, I'll take that block. And they go, oh, just kidding. I don't really have it, right? Conversely, I need protection from you. I have no idea who you are. You're just some random node on the network. There's, you just stand it up and you can look at my block and you can say, oh, that's a great idea. I'm just going to steal all the value in there. I'm just going to switch you know, the beneficiaries to me and you have this super valuable block and I'm just going to steal it all, right? So this is a trustless, permissionless network and you need some way to have everybody interact without, you know, any one entity being overwhelmed, right? Today, there are these things called relays, right? Under EPBS, you have a new mempool, right? That the, This idea of a mempool, this sort of uh, real-time area where transactions go in or, or, or bids go in to be um, uh, candidates. And then you can, as the receiver, you can dip into the mempool. So you're not exposed to it all. You're like, I'm just going to pop into the mempool and see what's there, right? Mempools are really useful constructs in this regard that they, they help provide some separation and they help uh, protect against denial of service attacks. But mempools also don't have great observability, like, you know, what's going on in the mempool. It's all ephemeral. There's no official record. You have global network effects and things like that. So, the current state of EPBS research basically has a new mempool being created called the bid pool, where builders will basically put bids in that validators can, can receive. They will be bonded, meaning each builder will basically um, uh, stake or, or, or lock up some ETH that will basically guarantee their bid is, value, is, is valid. So um, imagine I say I have a block that's worth 99 ETH but it's not real, it's it's invalid. Well, I have bonded that, right? So even if I try to lie to the network, you can then say as the validator, hey, this builder put this in here and, and they need to pay me out of their bond and poof, you get your 99 ETH and I've just lost 99 ETH. So you can actually create some, some insulation there. But what happens when you say, well, there might be a block that's a thousand ETH and not every builder can afford to bond a thousand ETH or 10,000 ETH or a hundred thousand ETH. So you actually have to have an upper bound on the bond to make it a level playing field so that everyone can participate. And yet when these really high valuable blocks happen, what are you going to do? Because the bond it's bigger than the bond, you're going to use a relay, right? And so under EPBS, at least the latest state of research, the relays are still around. Right. They do a lot less work, but they do all the high value work. Right. So we worry about a missed slot today with the average block being, you know, a fraction of an ETH. But imagine a missed slot under EPBS worth hundreds of ETH. It's going to be a problem. And so there's there's no you know, there, there's trade offs here to be made. And so um, th that research continues. The, the truth is, at least according to the latest research is. Relays don't go away until we get to this destination called MEV burn, where the MEV actually gets burned and, and gets distributed to all ETH holders, as opposed to today gets distributed to a validator. But there's a lot of questions about, is that something that will actually happen and, and, and concern? So there's still a lot of questions around this notion of MEV burn. So, um, you know, this space is, continues to evolve. It's, it's not um, set in stone by any means. Um, but, you know, the question is, 
How many participants are there? What are their incentives? Are there going to be more or less in the future? Because they do exert a lot of control over the network. All right, everyone, let's take a moment to hear about MetaMask's portfolio. If you're like me and Sam, managing your crypto assets across different wallets and networks can be so overwhelmingly complicated. That's why we're excited about MetaMask portfolio. All you have to do is connect your MetaMask wallet to get a bird's eye view of all your coins, tokens, and NFTs in one place. You can easily buy, sell, swap, bridge and state crypto assets at competitive rates all within the app and you get to choose from a vetted list of providers there's no more jumping between dozens of sites and apps metamask portfolio lets you do more in web3 your way giving you secure and convenient access to a wide range of features and services all within one place manage your portfolio your way with metamask portfolio peep the link in the description of today's episode to get started now i want to dive a little bit deeper into your personal opinions on mev burn just because to me it sounds like there's serious problems with people PBS in its current state. And the root cause of a lot of it is honestly this free market for MEV that's ultimately created by the users of the protocol. So yeah, just with that, uh, that little background, I'd love to get your take on the MEV burn. So, okay, big topic, right? Um, first off, you know, MEV is a fact of life. You have an ordered transaction system, you have MEV, right? So there's, there's no wave your magic wand and the MEV goes away. And, and by the way, like MEV exists all over the place. SEO, you know, everyone knows you type in Google, you get a search result. Being on the first page is better than being on the fifth page, right? You do all sorts of work to manipulate that. That's called SEO fine, right? Everybody understands, you know, when you buy a plane ticket, you get access to better seats or the more you pay, the, the better seats you get. That's, that's another example of MEV. It exists for concert tickets. It exists for um, stock trades and, you know, everything. So first off, no avoiding MEV. Second, yes to your point, Sam, without a user conducting a transaction, there is no MEV. Okay, that, 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 and that is the root. And, and we have said, and we continue to believe, that wallets are the sleeping giant in, in this category, which is today most wallets are not very MEV aware to, to, to MEV blind. They, they don't really have an opinion here. They don't take any precautions on behalf of the end user. And they just sort of say, you know, up to you, user to figure this stuff out. And, and it's not really practical for users to become, to be expected to become MEV experts. The example I always give is, Imagine you go to the, the grocery store and you go, oh, can't pay for your groceries with the Visa card on a Wednesday night if you have milk in your basket. Like what? Like, oh, everybody knows. Like, that's just a really not a great settlement that if you're going to shop on a Wednesday night, you got to use American Express or MasterCard. You're like, what? no, I just want to buy my groceries. Like, no, you got to pay attention to day of week, time of day. What's in your cart? What, what, what? grocery store you're using, what the box is, and like what the last three digits of your card are. Like nobody wants that, right? But that's the state of users in MEV today. There's all this crazy sophistication that users are expected to have. We envision a world and we're building infrastructure for wallets to make the wallets MEV aware, to help inform their users about what's going on, help them make better choices, right? So by the way, these are mechanisms to protect users from the adverse effects of MEV. There's been a bunch of work in MEV recirculation, and, and we were big advocates for that, that, that basically whatever MEV results from a user transaction should get circulated back to the user. Um, that really hasn't emerged as a big thing, meaning that there are protocols out there that do that. But the, if you look at the transaction volume versus the reward, the, the, the refund rate, it's pretty low. Um, it's mostly about protection. Um, this notion of MEV burn is a pretty compelling one. So this is research really pioneered by Justin Drake, who's a, is a super... Um, uh, um, and one of the top researchers in the EF. And, and his argument or the argument of Mav Burn is you have this really lumpy reality today where you have these certain blocks that have these very high MEV rewards. And it sort of is like a lottery where it gets randomly allocated to a specific validator, right? And then of course you have these staking pools. So if you have a big staking pool, you're, you get disproportionate share of these, these high valuable things. And it just feels a little... Uh, not equal, right? Um, by the way, we already have a good example of this with the base fee, with the with gas fees, which is, hey, look, if you burn these fees, then all ETH holders benefit because the supply of ETH goes down in proportion to the amount of gas with the base fee. And, and it doesn't matter who you are. If you're an ETH holder, you're, you're, the price is being sustained and going up. Right. And so the idea of Mav Burn is let's do the same thing with MEV, that rather than uh, 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 privileging the, the proposer 
or staking pool with this MEV or, or even privileging the validator class. So maybe you hold ETH, but you're not validating, right? Um, you're not staking it. Instead, just burn it, right? Reduce the total supply of ETH and, 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 and distribute the benefits to all ETH holders, right? Like I think the logic here is really pretty great. Problem is, is that the staking pools and the APY are totally dependent today on this MEV. And so basically, if we were to implement MEV burn, my understanding is it would massively reduce the yield on staked ETH, which is bad, right? And now, by the way, you have, you have hard forks that would need to implement these things and you'd have staking pools that would say, why would we implement this change that really adversely affects our business? Right. And so now you say, well, is it required or is this opt in? Why would people opt in? Might you create fracturing of the network as people try to avoid burning the map? And so, again, I'm not as close to this one, but these are proposals that I think are really compelling and well intentioned, but they have significant consequences that need to be thought through. Now, in our world, we say they are researching, right, which is code for still figuring it out. Right. And, and, you know, there's uh, there's very clever people who are working hard on these problems to try to figure out things that, that work well. And I wouldn't say any of this stuff is broken. I, I would say that it it needs it's constantly evolving and we're constantly learning in production. And, you know, as we learn more information, we need to evolve it based on on what's happening out there. So, you know, that's the, the interesting state of play uh, on today's Ethereum. Is it fair to say that uh, Mevburn then is mostly centered around changing like the more of the monetary policy side of Ethereum than rather than like, you know, okay, like, I guess I'm trying, I guess I'm struggling to see, like, I understand the smoothing of the, the lottery idea, but does that, that again, kind of plays into the more monetary policy side. Does it actually like change anything structurally with how MEV is dealt with within the uh, Ethereum proof of stake system? Um, I mean, so so the uh, again, I'm probably not the best person. I'm not. This is not what I do all day long. But what I would say is, uh, MEV is already altering the the landscape. Is already affecting the monetary supply and monetary properties of it. And and again, like this is a fact of life. This is not some sort of bug. It's just the reality. Um, and, and by the way, the reason why this gets so much attention in our world is because you can see it. It's free. You know, it's it's out there and transparent. Where in all these other domains, it's captive to a single provider. So. Uh, that it's it's not that there's more or less MEV on Ethereum, it's that it's the first environment where you can actually see and manipulate it. My general impression is MEV does exert uh, forces on, on the monetary nature of the underlying asset of ETH that so far that has not really been considered as part of the monetary policy. It's kind of out of band, right? Um, and that these proposals are, well, let's proactively deal with that. Let's bring it in band. Let's be intentional and deliberate about what happens with the MEV and its effect on the, on the monetary aspects of it. But again, there, there's no free lunch here. There's consequences to whatever approach is taken. Um, and there are winners and losers potentially along the way. And so that's why this remains you know, an, an area of conversation and, and of contentious debate because it's, there's no really clear right or wrong answer. I will say, you know, I don't think it's a mistake that Justin Drake, who's the progenitor of the ultrasound money thesis, is also working on these problems because it basically goes back into the same sorts of theories. Ultrasound is also one of the leading relays. Justin and his team are, are one of the leading relays as part of all this. They publish data and things like that. So it does really speak to how intertwined many of these issues are. Speaking of just how intertwined and small this industry really is, it's like, I just pulled it up rated.network just to check out like the past 30 days. There's only, you know, four builders building 92 to 95% of blocks over the past 30 days. So, I mean, that's a small enough group that, I mean, you could even text each other or sit down in a room and like, that's, I don't know, that's a pretty big point of, uh, of weakness for Ethereum, I would say. So I guess I don't even know exactly what my question is, but it's like, how do we get around this? How like it, it feels like something structural needs to change in, in in what's going on here? Yeah, I think that the reality is is these are so 
there's both a fairly small number of builders who build most of the blocks. And then there's also a very small number of relays who relay the blocks, right? Who are in this trusted position and, and, and particular relays is relay operators. So there are certain groups that operate more than one relay, but they're one entity behind them. And so, yeah, at this layer, there is a pretty high degree of centralization. And, and again, you can say, well, there's four builders, but it doesn't really matter if there's four on average. What matters is for the next block, how many builders can really compete for the next block? And depending on off-chain factors like asset volatility on Binance, there may even be one builder, right? That, that it actually turns out that for every time slice, there's really one actor, or one entity who's favored. Again, not the most decentralized thing. Um, my view is, is that the, the current state of affairs basically is very um, uh, um, reactive to the idea of rent taking or rent seeking of margin, right? And so what basically winds up happening is, hey, we're block native, we're a software company, we're trying to build infrastructure and software and, and make money at it, right? Because we have we're venture backed, we have investors, we're trying to pay our people, like all this sort of jazz. And, and that's viewed as problematic, right? That there shouldn't be actors in the middle who basically participate economically in all of this. And so as a consequence of that, because there's no economics in the infrastructure and software layer, all the economics economics go to traders, right? And, and it turns out that trading, particularly on Ethereum, is a very specialized skill. There's not very many people who can do it well, and you need fairly significant amounts of capital to do it effectively due to some of the realities of sex sex arbitrage in particular, right? And so it turns out that, yes, while anyone can be a trader, the vast majority of profits go to one of a small number of actors. And so, you know, traders are going to trade this phenomena. And so my view is the to create a more balanced network, a more decentralized network, we need to introduce more explicit economic incentives or we have the opportunity to do so that encourages participation, right? Um, uh, there have been debates about how many relays do we want, right? And do we want code-based diversity at the relay level? Like we at Block Native operated our own relay code base. We called it Dreamboat. We thought this was a good thing because now there's multiple code bases. So if there's a bug in one code base, maybe the other one doesn't have that and the network can be more resilient. We were told explicitly, no, that's bad. That's that's That increases the, the attack surface area and that, you know, in general, we don't want that. You're like, wait a sec. On the consensus clients, I thought we all agreed that Code-based diversity was a good thing, but now in the relay, it's a bad, like, how are these two things true at the same time, right? And, and again, you know, we're operating our own code base with no economic incentives behind it. So, you know, our general view is that all layers of the network, you want more participation, not less. You want more diversity, not less. That's code-based diversity. That's geographic diversity, et cetera. And, and, but we're creating or we've created systems that don't favor that. Matt, I'm really curious as to why you've stuck around Ethereum for so long. I mean, in its current state, it seems, you know, you could make a serious argument that there, there's other options out there that are on par to some degree with the decentralization level of Ethereum. And it sounds like you're very in the camp of decentralization, censorship resistance, permissionlessness, et cetera. So just curious why Ethereum is where you spend most of your time building. It's a good question. And it's one that we ask ourselves too. I mean, we have been part of the Ethereum ecosystem for a long time. We believe in its ideals. Um, we we work closely with the Ethereum Foundation and have received significant grants from them. And we think that that it is the proving ground for all of this stuff, that that Ethereum is, is not necessarily uh, a better or worse. It's just further ahead. It's, it's, it's a few chapters ahead of the book. And by further ahead, it's got more liquidity, it's got more volume, and it's got more experience and exposure. Um, I think the lessons that can be learned in the Ethereum ecosystem are highly relevant to other ecosystems as well. Um, and quite frankly, we, we are we're long, you know, believe we're, we're long ETH, long EF, long the, the ecosystem, even when it's challenging, even when it's frustrating, even when we might have disagreements around it. And, and we feel like uh, we got involved. I personally got involved because, you know, I'm really excited to build new foundations for the next economy. And it felt like in 2017, and it feels like today, the most likely candidate to be that foundation is Ethereum. Um, it's not the only candidate, but it feels like the front runner. And, uh, you know, we would like to, we aspire to be a part of helping it get there and, and helping it be a better version of itself and, and not um, 
implicitly descend into being just yet another trading system, right? Which, by the way, may be inevitable. Maybe the forces that are unleashed here uh, that we see, you know, writ large in the traditional financial system are just inevitable. Like all systems end up that way because of the way the economic incentives just naturally work. Um, I, I am still optimistic and idealistic that we can create um, structures that that are truly equitable, that are truly a level playing field. Um, we're not ETH maxis, though. Uh, we think that other ecosystems should exist, and and we are actively exploring, you know, adding support for certainly L2s on Ethereum, but also alternate L1s. Um, we think the more experimentation, the better, um, and and we're widely supportive of, of those ecosystems. Um, so, anyways, we're we're. We're long ETH. We're committed to the Ethereum ecosystem. We believe in ETH, but we're not exclusive to ETH by any means. Yeah, that, that viewpoint makes a ton of sense. It's something we, we think about quite often as well. And one thing you mentioned there was L2s, which is it, kind of this whole other can of worms, right? Like, if, let's say we perfectly solve MEV at the L1. Okay, well, now we have, you know, seven or eight popular L2s that we need to go do the same thing all over again for. How does that, how, how does that work? Well, but again, you know, MEV is a fact of life. So anywhere you have flow, anywhere you have transactions, you have liquidity, you're going to have MEV. And so um, are, is MEV going to emerge on L2s? Of, of course it will, because we're already seeing flow there, right? But it's different because you might have centralized sequencers. So now you have one actor in the middle who, who say, oh, well, we can solve it at that level. You go, hmm. It's going to be a lot of economic incentive to extract that, right? Now you have centralization there. You also have with L2s, you have the uncertainty of settlement down to L1. So you have an, an additional set of transaction states, an additional set of finality, and additional games that can be played. Um, you have core upgrades to Ethereum being made to facilitate L2. So the next major hard fork is Deneb coming up end of year, beginning of next year. It includes EIP 4844, which is explicitly to, to make life easier and transactions cheaper on L2s and introducing this new transaction type called data blobs. Um, it's interesting. It introduces a totally new class of transaction, a totally new class of actor. What's that going to mean? What are the, what are the opportunities to extract value from that? So, um, this is why I say Ethereum is just a few chapters ahead. We're, we're uncovering these issues uh, sooner than anyone else because there's more liquidity, there's more uh, a need for scaling, and it's more decentralized in, in many different ways, if not at all ways. So, um, you know, uh, this space is not going anywhere. It's not like, oh, MEV solved, lick, moved on to the next one. It's going to be a fact of life for a while. And, um, you know, we'll continue to shift and move and, and uh, be a topic of conversation. And, you know, by the way, you can say L2, you can say restaking. So what does restaking do for MEV? How does that increase? And what is about L2 and restaking? What about cross-chain bridges? Like it just gets exponentially more complex um, to deal with, but also, you know, interesting possibilities emerge along the way. I can't remember. I don't want to put words in Yuri's mouth, but we talked to him a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago now. And I want to say his thesis was MEV is a negative sum game. Like we should really be going FIFO at the base layer and um, basically exporting a lot of this stuff to L2s for them to deal with. What do you think about that theory? Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Uri's and, and he and I are, are friends. And, and uh, um, I guess my view is FIFO equals latency game. Latency game equals centralizing, right? That that uh, is that there are already a lot of latency games. There's already a lot of co-location games. I'm not sure if there is. I mean, the whole idea of the MevBoost ecosystem of the bidding architecture is it's, it's an attempt to minimize latency games because latency games fundamentally favor the the most sophisticated, deepest pockets, deepest pocketed actors. And yet, relays are our latency game. Right, like there's all these strategies, there's all this stuff, and if you look at what the relays say, they go, "We're the fastest, right? You should pay us because we're the fastest, right? We're the best one because we're the fastest." So, um, uh, I am. I, I think anything that that reduces down to latency game is is centralizing. Um, but again, you know, what is the best outcome? I don't know. Um, I, if I, if I had a, a solution to the MEV conundrum, I'd, I'd be in a different situation than I'm in right now. Um, my gut feel is MEV is a fact of life. I've already talked about this. And what we need is MEV aware infrastructure to level the playing field. The, the, the biggest issue facing the network today is the information asymmetries, which are rife through the, through the entities, with the most important actors, users, having the least information. 
and having access to the least sophisticated infrastructure. And, and we, Block Native, are, are very actively trying to solve that problem, to span that gap, to basically bring users up so they have access to equal information and they have access to massively improved tooling. Again, not maybe by working directly with us, but probably by working with one of our partners to, to be uh, insulated, protected, and, and participating in all of this. And then ultimately, that's where we're going to wind up, where we're going to have MEV recirculation, we're going to have MEV protection, we're going to have auctions and OFAs and things like that. And, and maybe we get to, to map burn eventually too, but again, that seems pretty far down the, the line. Um, but that's my worldview. Awesome. This has been a fantastic conversation, Dan. Unless you have any other questions, I'll kick it over to you, Matt, to tell people where they can learn more about Block Native, yourself, and any other shills you got for, for the listeners. Sure. I, I appreciate the opportunity to share our, our perspectives and, and to bring this stuff out. Obviously, it's complicated and nuanced. I appreciate everybody listening in. Um, you can find Block Native at blocknative.com or at Block Native on X slash Twitter. I don't know even what it's called anymore. Uh, I'm Matt Cutler. I'm at M Cutler. You can see it on the screen. Um, we're, we're out there at many of the major events. And so if, if you're in the same ballpark, I see around, do be, by all means come up, say hi. It's always fun to, to talk to folks who are out there. Um, and check out our tools. We have the, the best gas estimator in the ecosystem. We have this uh, transaction boost, which is a private RPC aggregator to, to, basically give you private transactions, a great observability and, and no compromise. Um, and if you're a builder, if you're building an application and you want to connect wallets, you know, check out Web3 Onboard. It's it's the best library out there for doing this sort of stuff. And it's inheriting all these properties that we talked about today. Um, and uh, if you're a wallet, of course, too, uh, we do a lot of deep work with the major wallets and we'd love to work with you out there as well. So um, we're a builder. We support other builders and uh, we want to just... Uh, do more to up-level the entire ecosystem, but in particular, um, balance things out on behalf of users and LP providers. So that's what we're all about. I love it, Matt. That was awesome. We'll be sure to include those links in the show notes to yourself as well as Block Native as a whole. And and uh, excited to, it was great to hear your thoughts today, man, and excited for the next chapter of Block Native as well. So thanks a ton. Cheers. My pleasure. Cheers. Cheers.